So welcome everyone to the October edition of the Serenity Connection. Um, I don't know about you guys, but the speed of technology advancement has been totally crazy. Um, when you kind of think about it, AI has increased accessibility to information, software applications have become more powerful and intuitive, uh, and there's been a greater uh, need and ability to create integration across multiple platforms to reduce the time uh, and intensity necessary to perform tasks. Um, so we kind of felt that this was a really, really good topic to be talking about. So today we have with us Al Borghese. He's a manager with Serenian Associates. I think it's the uh, first time we've actually done an interview of an internal person. So this is kind of new for us. Um, Al provides uh, accounting assistance and consulting uh, services to uh, clients of the firm. Uh, he's going to shed some light on how businesses can better integrate software to streamline operations. So welcome, Al, and thanks for doing this. Hey, not a problem, Ken. All right, so let's get started. Um, I guess the first thing I, I'm, I'm interested in understanding is, you know, when we talk about software integration, uh, what does that mean? And what are you seeing are the, the key issues that uh, organizations are facing? Well, the, the broad definition of kind of the software integration is, you know, kind of the process of connecting uh, one software application to another. Um, I think kind of synonymous with that is kind of automation, which is the larger picture of using, so, you know, kind of software um, to kind of automate the processes and procedures of um, pretty much any business function that is out there um, to get less humor, uh, human uh, interface and then more data-driven or more inputs. Um, I think the big thing here that when you discuss kind of software automation is kind of, again, the launching of and the speed that there's software that's coming out there to integrate different programs. I mean, you talk about, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, businesses were paper pen, um, spreadsheets and proprietary systems. Now software packages are coming out there. Um, you know, QuickBooks, now QuickBooks Online. Um, and then you look at Sage Intact is another one that's out there that's a very popular kind of when you're talking on the financial aspect of things, um, as well as, you know, the pandemic kind of sprung for, forward a lot of new softwares that seem to come overnight. Um, one thing that I'm seeing out there and a lot of the issues that are out there are softwares aren't talking to one another. So there's not any API, which is kind of that interface that middleman on technology and software that allows the softwares to talk to each other and allows programmers to create that interface um, between the various different programs. Um, yeah, Al, Al, you mentioned programmers, but I think one of the things we're also seeing out there is with AI, and we'll talk about more about AI later, but I, as, I, as I said earlier, I think things are becoming a lot more intuitive and you don't necessarily right. need to be a programmer anymore to, to kind of not necessarily write code, but kind of get things to work. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are definitely a lot of software app, uh, software applications and just apps in general that will write code for you. Like you said, AI um, that will write code for you as long as you give it the inputs. Um, and there it's making it a lot easier to kind of integrate different systems. No longer do you have to be kind of married to one software package that kind of does it all. Um you have kind of that API interface that um, these softwares allow you to kind of, as just a common user and not necessarily a data programmer to be able to uh, connect um, all these different things. Um, you know, the other thing that you're seeing out there is kind of now that, again, I'll, I'll go back kind of to the pandemic because I think that's what's brought up a lot of automation and kind of the software piece of things and software integration into the systems is it's kind of launched, um, especially I see it with a lot of small businesses um, and me, and even mid-sized businesses that didn't necessarily have all those tools. They implemented the tools, but not necessarily um, have they weeded out all the duplicative effort that there may be within the system. Um, they may be doing something and implemented a system, but then it's also being manually done on an opposite end without fully utilizing the power of some of the softwares that are out there as well. Yeah, I mean, we see that all the time with um, 
intermediate steps where uh, clients are utilizing Excel spreadsheets and they're kind of dropping data into an Excel spreadsheet, kind of mm -hmm. doing a lot of the work on the Excel spreadsheet, and then maybe re-uploading it um, where, again, I think, or maybe try to use that Excel as a bridge to get to another software application. Right. And, you know, I think a lot of that also has to do kind of re the reluctancy sometimes of the um, adoption of technology. You know, uh, a lot of people, you know, have gotten used to their ways of kind of doing things in Excel spreadsheets. Listen, Excel is a great tool. I use it on an everyday basis. Uh, you know, I write formulas within there to create automation within processes and procedures of some of the things that we do on, you know, a regular basis and some of the things that I do on a regular basis. Um, but interfacing that and utilizing that within the softwares that you use on a financial end, a uh, business end or anything, I think is extremely important. Um, and it's making it, I think, easier. Uh, no longer like, like we were talking about before, Ken, is that you know, no longer do you have to have that kind of coding background. You just have to be used to using an app and technology to kind of build that for you in a very user-friendly, easy step. One of the things that I think is a major concern right now, and, and I know this doesn't really sound like technology fits in, but, you know, bear with me a second. I mean, there, there's a staffing issue, right? Everybody's complaining that they don't have adequate staff. Um, the price of labor has increased dramatically so that, you know, um, in the past, maybe you could get some um, lower paid staff to do some of the more um, intermediate steps and things. And now that labor is is gotten uh, super expensive. You can find someone at all. Um, so how can organizations utilize uh, and businesses utilize and leverage uh, technology to maybe solve some of these problems and, and, and maybe use it as a way of, of cutting costs within uh, the labor component? Right. Um, I think as soon as we kind of went into a, um, you know, remote environment, it pushed a lot of businesses to go that way. And the staffing issues and everything kind of became apparent. Um, and the necessity to have kind of that software involved um, as people went out on, you know, leave or whatever it may be, I think it was important for there to be software um, that was involved and processes that were developed to kind of re not replace but to seamlessly move that from one employee to another, um, had it, you know, had it need to be uh, moved over. Um, you know, to, to your question, as far as with staffing shortages, it's how do I kind of create that ability for maybe, get, you know, as we're doing right now, remote, you know, how am I able to give that ability remotely to someone to be able to create their job task that to be able to retain an employee that's currently doing a task for me, let's say accounts payable, you know, um, and using an integration like what we were going to, I think one of the topics that we were going to talk about today is some of the software that's out there. You look at bill.com. So now that employee has to be out for whatever reason. Now they're able to utilize a tool like bill.com or, you know, to Pulte. There's a lot of different um, AP automation services that are out there and technology that's out there. But now that person could have access, you know, wherever they're going. Um, and it and it doesn't just limit you. And I think one thing that we're seeing even in the accounting industry is that one thing you're seeing is you're able to now do your job remotely and effectively. And I think that's important as far as with a job retention and a um, to kind of help with that work so shortage. You're no longer within a specific region that you need to, uh, or a certain locale that you need to recruit from. I think it opens up the pool as well. Right. I mean, I think one of the things that um, we're seeing also is, you know, when you do have that um, system integration and you do have, as you were talking about before, programs speaking to each other, uh, it eliminates some of the, as you said before, manual errors that can occur. So if I have my payroll software talking directly to my general ledger, or if I have my um, fundraising software automatically, you know, generating letters and things like that, it, it can really eliminate some of the um, maybe lower end manual 
tasks, which then can kind of elevate some of the staff that you have working for you so that you're doing more meaningful tasks. Right. You know, I think giving more meaning to some of the job tasks that there were, like, no longer is necessarily an AP clerk, just an AP clerk. I mean, a lot of times they tend to be a very big, important piece in the cash, uh, the cash flow management of the business. And maybe they're able to focus a little bit more on, on that piece of things. Um, also kind of going on some of the systems, you know, I think one thing that, you know, even through my career that I've seen um, is an AP clerk may have a certain process or, or any clerks, uh, you know, I keep on going back to AP, but it could be any, any of the clerks or anyone that's part of the accounting finance process or any of the processes within a business um, tend to have had their own way of doing things. Now with the use of technology and software, I think it kind of standardizes that process a little bit. Should that person leave tomorrow? Because listen, I think one topic, and it's not necessarily a topic here, was that great resignation where a lot of people were leaving and you were looking to fill those roles. And now that you're trying to look to fill those roles, not necessarily are you having to teach how the last person did it. Now you're able to teach a much more automated process and say, hey, this is this is kind of the you know, the procedure manual, this is how it's done and it's automated um, and it helps out a lot. What are you seeing in terms of, and you kind of, you, you talked about it a little bit before when you talked about build.com and some of that, but what are you seeing your clients using from an integration perspective, whether it be AP, whether it be payroll, whether it be, you know, um, whatever, um, and what sort of results do you, you think, or have they kind of reported back to you? So, you know, I think this is a, uh, this is definitely a big topic because there's a lot of different areas that and ways that we could kind of take this. I think one thing that you could kind of see is that you have a lot of the big players that are out in the market that are selling the all-in-one pack package. Hey, we interface with bill.com. We interface with ADP. We interface, you know, I'm naming some of the big names that are out there. And not necessarily are these packages um always fit and always the right fit for every business. You know, I think this goes into kind of that that mindset that you really have to be within the nonprofit or for-profit sectors as far as finding the right fit. Not necessarily is, again, that that package that's out there or, or you know, I'll even say, you know, like let's say Sage Intact or, or, Q, or QuickBooks Online, you know, QBO as it's known now. Um, not necessarily is all of their integrations the best um you know i'll kind of give you a, a battle story you know an instance for a client i had you know where their system was talking and was integrated with their accounting but they didn't realize that when they were going through let's say their reconciliation process and when it was automatically feeding in they didn't have that stop stop gap that needed to be of stop feeding information into the system um, and what it caused is it actually caused some balances at the end of the year to change when the, the audit was you know, necessarily occurring. Now, the reason why I speak on this is because I think it's important when you're looking at systems to make sure you're putting in the right systems, but not only that, but also the policies and procedures that no need to go in place. Now, to go back kind of on what you were asking about as far as the different software packages that I see out there, um, you know, one very popular one that's out there is Bill.com. Bill.com has very intuitive uh, AI, you know, if we're going on that topic, is their system learns you. How are you coding specific vendors, invoices? Um, and again, Bill.com is not the only player out there. There's Certify AP, there's Topalti, there's many different um providers that do this. Um, Bill.com is just one of those that are, hey, they're the they're the big guys also on the block that have that big name out there. Um, and now they also, they, I mean, they even have an AR piece where for some of our, you know, for some school providers, it makes it easier for them to automate that process of sending out an AR invoice for a private tuition, let's say, or even on a for-profit business to be able to bill their clients 
and and set automatic reminders that that person needs to pay and you don't necessarily need that AR person constantly calling up following up you know it kind of automates that and puts a nice list together for them um and that's kind of in the AP and the AR our, our area of things then yeah, you I mean, look sorry I don't mean to interrupt but we we we're, we're dealing with a client right now where uh they have an issue where invoices because they have multiple sites multiple locations Mm -hmm. um, and invoices are all, the purchasing function is all centered around one office, but when the invoices and stuff come in, they may not all come to one office, one person, there's approvals that have to happen at multiple office levels, and it becomes a nightmare pushing paper around back and forth through emails and everything else, and things inevitably are getting lost. Well, 100%, I think, you know, also, I think one thing that we saw, again, when everyone got the push to remote is, um, you know, you had to get checks, you know, multiple check signers. How do you handle that? How do you, uh, you know, do you have to have someone coming into the office to actually manually sign those checks? Or is there an approval process that could be put into place? You know, again, bill.com kind of solved that for some of my clients where they are able to set up kind of that approval chain um, where if an email is coming in from a specific vendor, well, maybe that vendor is handled by one of my managers, and that's who needs to approve this invoice. Well, I could set up that approval chain to go right to that person, not necessarily global. It could go get directed to that one person or employees, for example. Employees um, are asking for reimbursement for certain things. Uh, I guess a, another good kind of solution that's out there is if you have a lot of employee reimbursements that you, you are doing. Um, for staff is how do you how do you manage that and the best way to manage that is using something like an expensify a certify that's built for reimbursements um you know I, I remember the nightmare of you know having to take a look at you know employees kind of vouchers when we do kind of that testing on the audit side of things and you're having to manually look through receipts and then it's like wait a minute this wasn't on their expense you know package um that they're asking for reimbursement for you know, how do you automate that? And the nice part about a lot of these softwares and these applications is now it can be down. Our phones are so powerful. There are, they're, you know, computers, basically. And now that application can be added to the phone, snap a picture of a receipt right there. It's in an electronic file that's saved on the cloud. And now I could review that almost instantaneously and whether approve that voucher or disprove that, you know, voucher or that claim for reimbursement. And it's going right to the manager and directed to the manager that needs to go to. And I think that eliminates kind of that clerk aspect of things in the middle and saves some time where you don't have to sort through every employee and all right, this package goes to this manager, this package goes to this manager. And I think the, you know, kind of the whole, the whole, summary of that is not necessarily are you trying to eliminate jobs you know or you're just trying to make things more efficient to put people's efforts and like you were saying before more meaningful um in that you know kind of in that you know kind of conclusion in that kind of term you want to make you know everyone's jobs more meaningful rather than just kind of this repetitive action of things all the time yeah, and I think, you know, from an integration perspective, I know we've been talking a lot about, we're accountants, so we've been talking about a lot about some of the accounting functions, but I think that integration happens everywhere. I mean, as mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, uh, staying with accounting for a second, even, you know, a lot of the payroll companies now can push the information directly from the payroll company right into your general ledger so that you don't have to do payroll adjusting journal entries. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, if you're working with billing so separate billing software, I know a lot of industries have um, very good front end software applications to track service delivery, track billing, track all that stuff, but that may not um, be linked directly to their general ledger package. So again, right. how does all of that stuff integrate in and what are you seeing people using for that? Um, you know, I think one thing that you're kind, one thing that you're definitely starting to see is you're starting to see where Originally, a lot of large, you know, a lot, of, a lot of large businesses and more complex businesses were using these massive ERP systems to kind of manage everything, their accounting function, to manage their uh, customer relations. You know, it had a CRM system built in. And now 
software has kind of gone in the way of no longer do I need to be a big organization to get all the full usage of those type of things and be able to have to spend a high dollar amount to actually get that. Um, you know, like I was saying before, you know, some of these software companies that are out there, like, you know, I'll go back to QuickBooks and I'll go back to Sage because again, they're the big players out there in the nonprofit world. You have FundEZ and BlackBout. Um, you know, you have you have these softwares that now have other pieces getting added onto it, and they're starting to become larger ERP systems and not just accounting software. Um, you know, you look at uh, Blackboard and you look at uh, FundEZ on the nonprofit sector, they now have integrated um, fundraising modules that can be connected to your website and everything and to be able to do that um, function and to be able to manage those relationships with donors. Now, on the opposite side, on for-profit businesses, like I said, you have Bill.com um, and you have those softwares that are being integrated into software that are now building onto the accounting platform. So now you have like these accounting platforms that are starting to build out into other areas where an ERP system might have taken everything on the opposite end of everything that's going on in a business, combining it and going to financial. Um, and those systems, again, I think what we need to talk about a little bit there is, again, you always have to, and going back to our point before, is that you always have to make sure that the right system is in place. Um, and I, I, one of our other topics coming up, and I'll, I'll touch upon it now, is also making sure that the applications, with how fast these applications are coming out, is making sure that you're using the right application that has the right security behind it. We'll get into that in a second. I mean, one of the things that's cool about what you're talking about now is, you know, it used to be in a situation where if you wanted a good front end system, you were kind of forced into the back end of whatever that software application could support. I think now with some of the changes that are taking place and with some of the integration that's taking place, you can now pick and choose and you can kind of put together a whole bunch of different pieces, as you said before, to create a kind of a more robust system for um, your company that actually fits your company the best. Right. And I think no longer you have to put mm -hmm. all your eggs in one basket with one provider too. You could, like you were just, you know, kind of touching upon, you don't necessarily need to, um, you could find the software solutions that you are, and then you could use and have that API out there, which is kind of that language, like I said earlier, that bridge that speaks between the different softwares to connect them. So no longer do I have to just use QBO. No longer do I have to just use Sage related items. I could also go out there into the marketplace and use other software that maybe better fits my business. Okay. One of the, the concerns that I think a lot of people have is, okay, when we had paper, there was paper, right? There was documentation. There was substantiation. There was support, right? Now you're getting to a situation where we're now doing things through software, through applications and everything else. What happens to the support there? Um, do we still have the audit trail that we once had? Because um, anybody who's in, let's say, the, the nonprofit world who gets government funded or even the for-profit world who maybe gets certain funding, IRS or whatever, and now they get audited, how do you kind of handle all of that in terms of audit trail and information and documentation? So I think one important thing is, is that, you know, software applications that are out there is utilizing and managing something that has a cloud, well, that has a system of backup. I shouldn't say that it necessarily needs to be cloud-based. Um, Bill.com, again, they... I know bill.com and other AP software solutions, you get the invoice kind of in there and that it's in the cloud. One thing that I always like to do, and it all depends on the size of the operation, is if it isn't too cumbersome is to also keep another electronic copy of that somewhere else. Um, should I decide, number one, to switch a provider? Maybe I don't want to use bill.com. I want to go somewhere else. I outgrew it. Um, you know, at least I have an electronic copy, whether it's kept on my own servers, you know, depending on, again, security and protections and what information you want. Um, I think that's kind of how you have to manage it. I think there's been a lot of, um, you know, let's say government audits that we've seen in, you know, the 
in the nonprofit world. And also, listen, it's even coming, you know, sometimes even to the for-profit world between the, all the usage of the CARES Act funding and that people are getting audited left and right. Um, I know in the traditional nonprofit, you know, I'll go to there, you had a, a lot of those state agencies actually had the trouble of really understanding and, and actually accepting the electronic kind of way of life. And I think now, finally, we're seeing that they are moving to, yeah, there. this process and procedures could be there. Um, and I think one important tool and one important aspect of all of that is making sure, again, you're working with a software um, that is getting a, you know, kind of a SOC 1 report. And, you know, for those of you guys that are on here that understand what a SOC 1 is, um, you know, it's basically a, a audit firm that's coming in and taking a look at the processes and procedures that are behind kind of that that software that you're using. It's very, you know, it's very common used in the ADP world and the, the payroll world. But again, you know, what sort of internal controls are on that side of things as well? Um, and what sort of stamps and, you know, one other thing I'll go on is let's talk about like even signatures of approval. You know, how what rights are managed within these systems and are, you know, is there back end ways that I could go about things? I know like I like bill.com because there's, you know, it, it, there, everything is time stamped. Everything is there and it helps. There are, there are a couple of points you brought up, which I think are, are super great. And I think they need to be kind of maybe drilled home a little bit. One of the points mm -hmm. you brought up is um, you talked about the fact that you should keep an electronic version of it somewhere else, not just within the software application, which I understand the software application, that's kind of what a lot of them are for. But the problem is, you know, people move from one software application to another. And from a statute of limitations perspective, you have to understand what the statute of limitations are for different things. It could be six, seven years, could be, you know, three years, whatever it happens to be. Um, but if you leave that software application, you better make sure that you have actually not just have backup to the data that's sitting in that software application, but you actually have access to the application itself in case you ever have to pull that information up again. Right. So, you know, you have to make sure then if you're going to be moving from one software application to another, that you're keeping that data somewhere else so that mm -hmm. you can actually have, um, I've seen a lot of organizations, nonprofit organizations that use um, software applications that are provided by their funders. Hmm. And then their funders take it down and move to another version or new, move to a new software and you just lost all your data. Right. So you just have to be really, really careful about who owns the data, where is that data stored and, and everything else. The second thing you brought up that I wanted to kind of um, nail home a little bit also is that whole aspect of SOC compliance and the fact that um, not every single software application does go through a SOC review, um, but that SOC review does provide some level of assurance to the people who are using it that, you know, when you put the data into the black box of the software, what's happening within that software application is what it's supposed to be doing. Right. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at multiple software applications, one has a SOC 1 report, one doesn't. Um, the one that has a SOC 1 report gives you a little more assurance that there's safety there. Right. Which yeah. then brings up my next question. I mean, you know, as we rely more and more, and you touched upon it a little bit, we rely more and more on um, software and multiple systems and integration, and and you're allowing different software applications to speak to each other so that you're creating paths maybe into some sensitive data, whether it be payroll information or into financial data or HIPAA compliant data that's now communicating back and forth and being transferred back and forth re between systems. Um, what are the major concerns and, and what actually do we need to do about um, some of those concerns that are popping up? All right. So I guess with some of the concerns that are popping up, I think one and foremost that we're seeing when we come in and, and we take a look at, you know, clients is making sure that you have a cybersecurity policy, insurance policy. Um, you, I don't know how many organizations I've already stepped into that don't have one in place. And the... Hold on, I'm going to clarify. You said yep. cyber insurance policy, and then you said insurance policy. And I think... Uh, no, no, the, the cybersecurity, insur you know, insurance policies that are out there. So the cyber insurance, that's for protection. But then I think they also need the cyber policy to ensure that um, the companies are doing things right. So actually, right, I, think, right, right. I think it's both. Yep. Go ahead. You know, I, I think 
both of them are extremely important because one let's let's face it we're living in a world that has gone remote and there's security issues out there um and you know there are hackers all the time trying to get into systems get financial financial data sensitive data um and take advantage of that now that could cripple a you know that could cripple a business and i you know i don't mean to be an alarmist or or someone that that you know is saying that but i think you know it can't always be the second thought like let's automate the process but then let's figure out security behind it i think you have to think of both you know um together uh synonymously with one another and you have to really you have to take a look um, you know, this goes on what you were talking about before, the SOC 1 compliance. How is that system securing my data? And is it, you know, following all the protocols that are out there? And I won't go into all that kind of technical jargon, but um, is it following the latest security protocols that are out there? Is there a secure, is there even security software and virus software and all this technology that out there monitoring what's happening within the system as well? Um, and asking those, right. sorry, and asking those questions to the software providers up front before you sign on to things, I think are very important. Yeah, well, um, one, of, one of the other things you mentioned earlier, and this kind of goes hand in hand with this, is you mentioned that there are a lot more people who are working remotely. And when you're de dealing with people working remotely and they're utilizing some of the software applications, are they opening up exposure for the organization? And how are people getting into the system and what sort of safety protocols, and that's maybe for another topic, another conversation, but those are all things right. that, as you said, you need to be thinking about when you're you're looking at doing an implementation of the software. Well, and I think, you know, one thing that has become new and prevalent now is, you know, the introduction of, you know, chat GPT um, and AI. Um, you know, this is a hot topic. It's been something that a lot of accounting firms and a lot of businesses and, you know, that's out in the news is, you know, the open AI-ness of everything. I was just on a uh, organizational meeting the other day and they, you know, they prefaced their meeting by saying, listen, do not use open AI to record this meeting to refer to back later. Because I think there is that fear with AI. And one thing, again, to keep in the back of the mind of whether or not your employees are using it is the openness of it. The whole point of AI um, is to learn uh, learn from what humans are putting into the system and build upon that and allow that information to be out there. So before you use AI for certain things in your business, be careful about the information that's being put in there because it's 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 open. It could be out there. You got to understand kind of the ins and outs of things and you got to caution it. Um, you know, AI is very, AI is very new. And you know, uh, as far as in the mainstream, it's been out there. Uh, listen, the internet's been learning from us. I mean, how many times have you clicked on a page because you Googled, you know, that you like this couch and how many advertisements do you get uh, when you search the internet and you're going on the next page that has an advertisement there for the couch? It, you know, it, it tracks. Um, and I think that's, I, you know, I think those pieces are important and they are useful. You know, how many times have also have you used AI? I mean, think about the AI that even a lot of the phone GPS is used now. You hop in your car, it knows you're in the car and it tells you, all right, this is usually where you go. It's going to take you 15 minutes. You know, how many times in the morning if I jumped in my car and it says it's going to take you 20 minutes to get to Serena and Associates office. You know, it's amazing the, the flow of information and what is available out there. Yeah, and, and again, I, I think that's a good point. I mean, when you're looking at a software application, you have to understand um, how the data is used, how the data is stored, um, whether what's going on with any information you put in it. And you want to make sure that um, since we were talking about AI, what sort of um, AI policies and develop policies for your staff so your staff know that if they are going to be utilizing some of these applications that they need to be careful about the integrity of data that's being right. put into it. Because if right. you're using your own internal data for protocols or for uh, analysis or whatever, you might be exposing all of that internal data to the outside world. 
Well, and I think that plays into the point of what you were talking about before. How do you manage remote employees? And I think that's that's an important thing to think about, whether you have in, in-house or external IT, um, is how do you manage that? How do I make sure my remote employee isn't feeding something into a AI-based type software um, that I don't want it to be? to to create efficiencies within their job uh, you know i think that's why sometimes some of the more proprietary type systems or systems that kind of have gone on in place tend to be a, a good thing because they've they've gone through those checks and balances i think just some of this technology that's out there and and we're constantly having to embrace and grow with um yeah, i was gonna say free is not always best yeah. Now, some right. of it is you know you got to think about what safety protocols you're giving up on some of the free uh, no charge software versus some of the applications that maybe you have to pay for, but they're going to provide more uh, safety protocols for your organization, right? For your business. Um, you talked about earlier. You talked about um, cloud-based systems, mm -hmm. and you said a lot of the software applications started to move to a cloud-based system. I mean, is there a real difference between a cloud-based system and a um, in office system, is that something that people should be looking at as one is better than the other or not really? Well, I, you know, again, I think you're in two different environments here. I mean, you're looking at where if you have your own system, think about the cost that's involved in it. You have to have your own kind of database. You're, you have to have the space for server for a server room to actually do it. Um, but you have control or should I, I should kind of caution to say control. You have as much control as you could possibly can as far as over that data that's going and linking back to and from your server. Um, these larger organizations, and as you go to cloud-based, they're using many servers all over the different all over the place. Um, and you in a cloud-based environment, you're able to have more access um, to to work in different environments. Cloud-based, you know, I think it's it's gone in a direction where it's been accepted, but I think you, again, have to understand how those systems, you know, the systems are running um, and what you're doing. I think the advantages of using a cloud system is obviously, as anyone has experienced, is the cost. The cost of a cloud-based system is, is much less expensive and the one thing that you're seeing is, is that a lot of so, like accounting softwares now, a lot of them are starting to discontinue their use of a desktop version or are starting to charge more for a desktop version of their software than the cloud-based version of their software. Um, and again, no, there's no one size fits all for a business. Um, I again, kind of leaning on the point of what we were talking about before is your document, you know, retention is all that data is that that's getting fed into a cloud based system or even your own system. It's also making sure that you have those proper backups, because my fear is, is that whenever an uh, organization decides to change is have you backed up all that data to make sure that based off of the statute of limitations that you have all that information, you have accessibility to all that information. Yeah, I mean, the other good part also, uh, with some respects, with respect to using a cloud-based is automatic updates. So as new mm -hmm. um, revisions to the software come out, they get automatically pushed up and uploaded as opposed to, um, you know, with a, um, you know, I would call it um, one that's, that's you, just yours. I mean, you know, a um, desktop version of or whatever. I mean, you're going to have to get that, that, a uh, new version of it and you have to buy the new version and upgrade it. So that, that comes, uh, it's harder maybe to integrate with other people. Right. And, and it could create integration problems with other software. Speaking of which, you know, if you are using certain software and they, they are getting upgraded on an automatic basis, I mean, have you seen problems where that upgrade can maybe kick off a, um, someplace where two systems are talking to each other and all of a sudden upgrade hits and all of a sudden they're not talking to each other anymore? Yeah, I have. Um, I think sometimes when there is an update in software, um, that does definitely happen. Um, again, if it's if it's a software that package, you know, a lot of times they do they do preface preface that that make sure that everything kind of interconnects and, and works. But again, I, I think you do have to be cautious sometimes of the automatic updates to make sure that API 
that that kind of bridge that's written between the two softwares to connect to one another um, isn't being broken because one may all of a sudden get updated and all of a sudden now it breaks that link. Um, and now everything does have to be done manually and you didn't even know it. A lot of times, most of them are pretty good when they know that there's an API bridge there between two different softwares to let you know, hey, th there, this may be down for X amount of time um, until we get an up until we update it on our end. Um, yeah, but but they, I have seen instances of that. Absolutely, I was going to say there are there are companies that actually write their own bridges, and then right. sometimes that can create the break there. Um, when it comes to integration of applications. Um, how do you determine which applications work best together? Um, and can you truly really just pull an application off the shelf, plug it in and, and get that automatic integration or the things that have to happen? So there is definitely that you can pull it off the shelf and get it. You know, that's what, again, Sage Intact, QuickBooks Online, that's what they're selling you. Hey, we integrate with bill.com. We integrate with... Uh, uh, let's say Divi cards or Ember's cards. The, you know, I I speak. I didn't actually speak about this technology earlier, but you know, now you see a lot of organizations moving away from the traditional credit card. Now you see them moving to something called Divi or Ember's, where these are solutions that are out there for employee reimbursement or for management of um, tr uh, business of business credit. Um, and it's allowing them to monitor it, get the re again, like I was talking about earlier, the software application for receipts for employee reimbursements. Well, the same thing goes for even now credit cards and that there's now a lot more insight into those. Um, I actually I actually put in, in place in another one of my clients um, where there are limited cards that are issued because they they were using their debit card for all their transactions. And now they handed it out, you know, and we're handing it out. And then all of a sudden, whoop, their pops debit card fraud right to their bank account. It's like, oh no, why did you do that? Um, let's kind of set something in place. So we had to look at the systems, get them set up in place. And now we're using these virtual cards. Now, when the employees go out on, you know, uh, an excursion or whatever they're doing for their, you know, business, I can set the limit of the time that that virtual card's available for them. So there are applications, you know, out there, um, you know, kind of for those various different, you know, kind of reasons um, and that help. Um, but there are things that you could purchase that are like you could start using them right off the shelf. I mean, I don't know how many times I've already implemented, you know, different AP systems. And basically, I could have them set up by, within a day, kind of using that system, depending on also, obviously, how um, complicated their approval chains are and all of that. Um, you know, and, and it really has saved a lot of time. Even like you no longer have to wait for a board meeting to get the board treasurer or president to sign off on a check. That I could have them sign off on it right in the system electronically and it's done and it gets alerted to their phone. Um, and everything is again time stamped, IP driven. So, you know, again, that's making sure that I'm using a system that also time stamps it, IP address stamps it. So I know it's coming from that person. And it's not someone else that signed in for that uh, person. I, I, there are those checks in the background on a lot of those softwares. So a lot of these softwares are actually creating stronger audit trails and stronger control environments for the organizations, as well as saving time, money. And right. I, I mean, look, even time entry systems. Now you have them geofenced. Someone's out of that geofence and, you know, it gets pink that you, you know, someone clocked in outside of that geofence. They didn't say where they were. Right. Well, um, Al, this was awesome. Um, I actually thought we would uh, need a lot more questions, but we just burn through the time really quickly. So um, thank you, Al. Um, and hopefully everybody got out of this what I got out of it. I thought this was amazing. Um, and thanks everyone for joining this month. Um, tune in on November 14th for our next Serena Connection. Our guests are going to be Susan Krieger and Jill Krumholz from Real HR Solutions. Uh, we're gonna have a conversation about the new pay transparency regulations that went into effect last month uh, and also retaining employees. I think that's something that everybody should be interested in. So until next month, uh, stay connected and thanks everybody for joining us. Take, Take care. care, everyone.